Hello, Peer family, and welcome to our online service for the week of April 24th. We're so glad you've joined us today. And if you're new, an extra special welcome to you. And by the way, we love community. We love getting to know each other. So if you are new, we'd love to hear from you. Please drop us a line at info at the peer dot church. We'd love to get connected that way. And also, something I want to mention today before we move into our service, if you are kind of new to us and you're not sure what we're all about, there's a couple things that I wanted to mention. One, we love kids, and we've got a really good kids ministry called Kids Zone, a wonderful group of leaders. It happens every Sunday at 10 a.m., basically during our in-person service. So if you're thinking of coming in person and you have kids, there's a place for them. We'd love to meet them, and we want to, you to know about that. And also, with that in mind, our kids group just did something really fun last, um, just last Sunday over Easter. They, um, and we've got a video available of that. They came up, and we worshiped together, and they did some actions to some songs. Go check out our, our Facebook page or our Instagram, and uh, you'll see that there. You can watch that there. Just wanted to make sure you knew about it. Secondly, one thing about us too is we've got a youth group. We've got a youth group that meets on Tuesday evenings at 6 p.m., often in person here at the pier, sometimes on Zoom. And this is the time for us to hang out, have some fun, have some snacks, but also to learn together in a safe environment about Jesus and explore our faith together. So that happens every Tuesday. You can email us about either of these things at info at the pier dot church if you'd like to hear more. Great. Well, I'm excited about our service today. We've got a time of worship together coming up. We're also going to go through a, a prayerful reading of Scripture together. And we're moving into a new mini-series called How to Read the Bible, Reading Biblical Narrative, which I'm really excited about that one too. So why don't we start off with prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this time together and we just pray that you would use it as you see fit. I pray for each of us that we would sense your presence and sense your love in this time, and that each of us would hear from you in this time through your word as we engage in worship, um, whichever means you see fit. We just want to invite you, Holy Spirit, to guide our time and to move through all of this. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Jesus, we want you. We want you. Come and consume God, all we are. We give you permission, our hearts are yours. We want you. We want you. tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love and shame no longer has a place to hide and I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Well, this power that can break up every chain, this power that can empty out the grave, this resurrection power that can save this power in your name power in your name with this power that can break up every chain oh this power that can empty out the grave with this resurrection power that can save doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance. My fear 
doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your Before we move into our message, I wanted to just extend this time a little bit more. I would love for us to prayerfully read through Scripture together. Maybe you've been with us before when we've done this, but we're going to go through the practice of Lectio Divina together now. This is a, a time where we will read Scripture through. We're going to read it through three times. And the idea is that we just kind of listen to the words, let them wash over us, and we make space for the Holy Spirit to speak to us through them. And to help in that process, what I'd love for you to do is just kind of get yourself comfortable, really quiet your mind, focus on your breathing, whatever you need to do to, to get into a really comfortable, relaxed space. And I'm going to read through a passage three times, but each time I read it, I'd like for you to gently ask a question of the Holy Spirit. And it, it, I'm expecting that the Holy Spirit will, will speak an answer. The first time I read, you're going to ask what the second time I'm, I'm going to read, and you're going to ask why. The third time it will be, what next? So the first time is, is there a word, or, or sorry, what word or phrase is the Holy Spirit kind of bringing out of the passage for you? And then you kind of reflect on that. The second time, it's why. Why do you think maybe the Holy Spirit is bringing that word or phrase out? And the third time, it's what's next. Well, what does the Holy Spirit want you to do next? with that word or phrase. Maybe it's connecting to your life or your situation right now. Great. So I'm going to be reading 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10. So let's read it through together the first time. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Let's take a moment to allow the Holy Spirit to bring a word or a phrase out from that passage. Let's read it again, and this time we're asking why. Why is that word or phrase popping out? But God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. We're going to read it a third time now, and here we're asking the Holy Spirit, what next? What would you like me to do with this word or phrase going forward? But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to us today through Scripture. And may what you've told us today really impact us in a way that, that changes us for good. 
Thank you for your great love for us, dear Lord, that you speak to us. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. As I said earlier, I'm excited to move into our next mini-series today. We're taking a look at, at really exploring the question, how do we read the Bible? And we're going to be zeroing in on an important part of Scripture, and that's biblical narrative. So we're learning how to read biblical narratives. Now, when we ask that question, how to read the Bible, I bet you it brings up different feelings for different people. <laughs> because I'm sure for all of us, we've got a complicated relationship sometimes with Scripture. <laughs> and for some of us, we love it. For some of us, uh, the, uh, the, you know, a perfect Saturday morning is sitting with a warm cup of coffee and Scripture open and just digging into it. But for others, that seems a little bit scary. That's not something we like to do. For some of us, reading Scripture is difficult. When you read it, the words seem kind of foreign and, and it's hard to tell what it means. It, it just seems so distant. Or maybe when you read certain parts, it just seems really kind of frustrating. You, you see some of these things and it just doesn't make any sense. Well, this mini-series is designed to help, to help us in our approach to Scripture. Now, for myself, I can think uh, back through my life and my approach to Scripture, and it's certainly changed over the years, that's for sure. Thankfully, somehow early on, I think it was because of really good influences in my life, I loved Scripture from really as long as I can remember. I've kind of, for a long time, had a, a real love for reading Scripture and, and learning from it, and especially reading the stories from Jesus and his teachings. And as I got older, reading the Old Testament stories, being introduced to the characters, I've had a pretty good relationship with Scripture. But it's not to say it's been perfect because there's been times when I've been really frustrated by it, especially certain things that happen in the Old Testament. It's really hard to reconcile those things with Jesus and, and Jesus' example. So I get that part for sure. And how I've approached Scripture have certainly changed over the years. I remember reading it early on, not having really any appreciation for the cultural and historical distance between me and the early writers, and had no idea about reading things from a historical context or things like that, or knowing about the different genres or types of writings in the Bible. But as I kind of grew and got a bit older and studied more, uh, things changed. Studying philosophy, it really impacted kind of how I approached the Bible. And also going to seminary, man, that really opened up a whole new world of approaching Scripture. And I did my thesis on Psalm 137, the history of interpretation of that beautiful but also difficult psalm. And I realized the church, through church history, we've been in a major process in terms of how we've approached Scripture. It's changed a lot over time. So all that to say, it's a complicated question. How do we read the Bible? As I said, I'm hoping that our mini-series helps in bringing us in the right direction, giving us some tools to approach Scripture. And also, this won't be the only time we do it. This one's going to be two to three weeks, but we're going to revisit this, I think, again and again throughout the, maybe throughout the years, and kind of approaching this from different angles and bringing more tools into our tool belt to hopefully help equip us to really soak in what Scripture wants to offer us. Now, as I think about it, here's one major thing that I've learned about approaching Scripture. I mean, overall, what we really want to do is let Scripture speak to us. We want to we derive meaning out of Scripture. Really free, let it be free to speak to us. In other words, we don't want to read things into Scripture, putting our own meaning into Scripture. That's where the danger really happens. And in doing that, in, in really um, making space for Scripture to speak to us, I've found that the kinds of questions we ask, that's really important. The kinds of questions we go to when we're reading Scripture can make a big difference in what we're gaining or getting <laughs> from Scripture. Getting would be the better word. And so let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's take a passage in Job as our, as our example. Job 1, 6 to 8. One day, the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up 
and down it. Just a little snippet there. But talk about an interesting passage. I mean, a lot is going on there. Now, if you were to sit down with that and try to study it, or maybe sit down with a group to study it, I wonder what kind of questions would come to mind first. Maybe for a lot of us, we might ask like a historical question, like, and, and a, like a fact-based question, kind of like, did this really happen? Did it happen like it was, like they're saying there, you know, and when did this happen? Or we might ask like a theological question, asking, oh, okay, so God and Satan here, but this is really strange. Why is Satan talking to God? What does this teach me about my idea or concept of Satan or the Satan as it actually is in the original language? Or we might ask like a geog geographical question, kind of like, wait a minute, okay, Satan's on the earth, but then he's now visiting God. Is this happening in space somewhere? Lastly, we might jump straight to a practical question, a personal question, and, and ask, okay, what does this teach me about my own faith journey? Maybe we see Satan here and we think, okay, so if I'm in a situation where I feel like Satan is present, is this teaching me what to do? Those are some questions we might ask of the text here. And while these aren't bad questions per se, actually, in a lot of instances, and this is the case here, they might not be the most helpful questions to start out with. And actually, jumping to these questions might actually distract us from what the text is trying to speak to us. It might actually take us away from the author's original purposes for writing this. So that's what I mean by knowing the right questions to ask. And that's what we're exploring today. We're, we're going to start to answer that question of how do we know what questions to ask so that we, we can really derive meaning from Scripture. Well, there's a lot happening <laughs> in Scripture. You've got a number of books, and each of those, kind of, those books can be in a bit of a different style sometimes. There's general groupings, general genres that we can learn from. But even within those books, there's a lot of different types of writings. You've got narratives, you've got poetry, you've got laws, you've got genealogies all sorts of different things, especially in the Old Testament alone. Well, today let's look at narratives, I think. I want to start, our, for, for our mini-series, we're going to look at reading biblical narratives. And the reason why it's good to start here, for one, there's just so many stories in the Bible. I've been told that there's around, uh, that around the third of the Bible is actually stories. So it's a really important thing to learn about. And also, when you think about it, the Bible itself, from front to back, it's a big narrative. It's a big story about God. It tells the story of God's creation of the universe and, and planet Earth and everything in it. And it ends off with God's new creation. And in between, it tells the story or the narrative of God's redemption, that, that what we call redemptive history. So the whole of the Bible is a story with a lot of different stories in the middle, kind of connecting it all together. So, the Bible's a story. There's a lot of stories. Good place to start, learning how to read biblical narrative. And the thing is, once you learn to identify when you're reading a story, and actually it's pretty easy to do, it's pretty intuitive, we can spot a story from a mile away, that helps us to frame our questions. Actually, I have found it really helpful, especially in a group setting, to pretend when we're reading these stories, pretend you're in like a book club and you are together exploring and learning from a really brilliant work of literary art. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible is more than just literature, but it is also literature. And when we approach it that way, ask kind of questions that we would ask of a great work of literature, that's pretty fruitful, I've found. Well, for the remainder of today, I just want to talk about two things. First, the purpose of biblical narrative, a little bit on that. And then I want to get into a pretty key feature of biblical narrative. You bring those together, it's going to be really helpful, I think. First, let's talk about the purpose of biblical narrative. Well, stories in general, they're really important. I mean, it's kind of distinctly human to tell stories. And why do we tell them? Well, we learn a lot from them. We learn a lot about ourselves and our relationship to all of creation. And also, they're really engaging 
right? They're such a wonderful uh, way of inspiring us, of even kind of influencing and persuading us into action and those sorts of things. And they're good for all ages. Kids love stories. Adults love stories. We all love stories. So that goes into their purpose. And the biblical authors, I think, know this. They're using stories, I think, overall to inspire us to faithfulness to God and to reverence for God. There's telling stories of God's works in creation and, and people's responses and how people are acting. It's all these stories to inspire us in that way and also to influence us and, and to um, maybe even persuade us to be faithful in the sense of obedience, to put this stuff into action and to, to listen to God's will and to act out on God's will, to obey God's will. So that's kind of the purpose of these stories. And I hope you see when you frame it that way, you realize, okay, that helps us think about the kind of questions that might be really helpful. When I'm reading a, a story, say I'm reading a, um, a, a gospel, which is one big narrative, I'm asking, how is this inspiring me? How am I feeling inspired here to be more faithful to God? Or what kind of things is it calling me to in my faith journey with Jesus or with God? You see what I mean? It, it moves you into that kind of frame of mind. So that's a little bit about the purpose of the stories in Scripture. It's a beautiful one. Let's now talk about one of the really important features of stories, okay? Next week, we're going to touch on this too. We're going to talk next week about the importance of understanding plot and structure of biblical stories. But today, let's talk about characters and characterization. Stories in the Bible, they don't just tell us what happened. They also go into a lot of detail on who was involved. <laughs> There's a lot of people in these stories and the authors they actually go to a lot of trouble to teach us about these people and to develop the characters. And you know what? Asking certain questions around the characters really helps us to start digging into the meaning behind the stories, what the stories are about, what the author's trying to tell us through the stories. Now, let me give you two general practical steps here for this when we're talking about digging into the characters. First, one big step, identify the main character. Each story will have one main character that kind of rises to the top. And so the reason why that's important is it helps us to know what the story, like it, knowing the main character will help us knowing, in knowing what the story is about. Let, let me show you what I mean. So think about the well-known story of David and Bathsheba. When David basically sleeps with another man's wife because he can't resist. Now, in that story, it's important to know who's the main character here because that changes kind of what we might think the story is all about. If David's the main character, then this is like a story about a king who's making mistakes, maybe a king who's falling from grace. But if Bathsheba is the main character, that kind of changes the focus, right? Might change the themes. It could be about what it's like to be a woman in a patriarchal, male-dominated society, to be a, a, a woman with a king like this and her experiences. So you see what I mean? Knowing what the, who the main character is helps us to know what this story is about, what the author's trying to tell us. And there's some pretty easy ways of identifying the main character. Really, if you kind of link up the stories that are related to each other, because what you'll find is there's going to be little stories and they come together to form bigger stories. You go through kind of a bigger story and what, what you can do is you can ask these questions. Who's in these scenes the most? Who's in these little scenes the most? That's a clue to who the main character is. Um, you could also ask who's the focus of interest here, especially on the narrator's part. Um, you could also ask, um, what's kind of the big themes that are happening here? Who's involved in those big themes? And lastly, who's involved in the really key scenes, the really pivotal scenes, like the beginning, the end, the climax? The person who's kind of involved in those things will be the main character. And that's pretty good once you can identify that. As I said, it'll help us know what the story's about. Now, once you've identified 
who the main character is, the next step here, next general step, will be to see how, who are they, what are they like, and how do they develop. That's also a key to knowing the meaning of the story. Now, how they develop and who they are, the author is going to do a lot to help us there. Some of it's detective work. Some of it's obvious. Sometimes the narrator will tell us things directly. They'll say, here's something you need to know, basically. They'll say, this person is like this. We get this a lot with David, especially at the beginning of his story. So the narrator will tell us. And the idea there is we can trust that. That's reliable information that we're going to need as we go along. It's, it's important to the meaning. But secondly, the author will use indirect means. So what do I mean by that? Well, we can tell things about the character from their actions, from the things that they say. And actually, especially what they say at the very beginning of their story, that's pretty helpful. You want to tuck that away for later. We can also learn about the characters from symbolism, from if the author ever describes their appearance. That's really important. Um, and we can tell about the character from the kinds of things people say about them. But all of that, you got to kind of bring it all together and you got to really do some, like I said, detective work, especially around when people are saying things about the main character. Because that, it's not necessarily the truth. <laughs> what I mean by that is you got to know that character too. Is that character a generally reliable character in this narrative? If so, yeah, we can probably trust what they're saying about the main character. But maybe that character is a flawed character. Maybe that character is actually one that's kind of got some ulterior motives. So maybe we got to take what they say with a grain of salt. That's kind of the fun of it. You got to bring it all together, weigh it all out to kind of see, okay, what are we meant to take away in terms of learning who this character is and how they are developing? And lastly, sometimes the author will use the narrator to be really explicit about things, but sometimes the narrator will be silent. It'll just be the action. It'll be the characters interacting and talking and actions and all of that with no commentary. When that happens, that's especially interesting. That's purposeful as well. Everything's purposeful in these narratives and in these stories. That's a clue for us that we actually were invited to talk about it then. To, to talk, well, mm, I wonder what's happening there. That's interesting that this person said that and that. You start weighing it. What do you think about that, that they said that? Was that a good thing? Was that a bad thing? What does that tell us about the character? You know, it's, it invites that kind of conversation. It's ambiguous for a reason. Those are some of the ways that the author, the, the kind of the tools the author uses to describe the character, help us to get to know them and to see how they develop. And again, that's all important for us approaching it and really learning from the text, hearing what the author wants to say. Okay, let's go to an example. It's much better when we have an example. And okay, also here, this isn't just a lesson for us. We're here to hear from scripture together as well. So I'd like to use this example, not just to kind of dig in to, to learn this method, but also I think we're going to see from it something really encouraging about God through this and, and what we can kind of tell, I think, from a lot of stories in Scripture. So we're going to go to this example and then we're going to close up with, a, uh, I think, a really encouraging thought to finish off. So we're going to go to the story in Genesis 25, 27 to 34 of Esau and Jacob, the well-known well brothers. They've, they, just before this, They've um, both been born. They almost came out at the same time, but Esau came out first. So he is the elder brother before this story happens. And then here's where it picks up. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skilled hunter, a man of the open fields. But Jacob was an even-tempered man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for fresh game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now Jacob cooked some stew, and when Esau came in from the open fields, he was famished. So Esau said to Jacob, feed me some of the red stuff. Yes, this red stuff, because I'm starving. That is why he was also called Edom. But Jacob replied, not so fast. First, sell me your birthright. Look, said Esau, I'm about to die. What use is the birthright for me? 
But Jacob said, mm, swear an oath to me now. So Esau swore an oath to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate and drank, then got up and went out. So Esau despised his birthright. Genesis 25, 27 to 34, and that's the NRSV translation. Well, what happened here? The what is pretty significant. We've got an exchange of birthrights. One brother becoming the elder brother through some trickery, actually. And this is really significant for the Israelites and their history because Jacob will become, will be renamed Israel. He is the forefather of the Israelites. This is how he becomes the elder brother and the one who's the, you know, the oldest son to Isaac, as in Abraham and Isaac. So this is pretty significant stuff on Israelite, in Israelite history. And Esau, he's significant as well. He's going to have a whole people named after him too, the Edomites. That's why the author says he's also called Edom. So the what is really important. But as you notice, the author is using the narrator to tell us a lot about these people, really setting things up in an interesting way, and we're starting to get to know these characters. So what does the narrator say? That's always a really important question. That's going to give us some really important clues into what this is all about. Well, he starts off by saying this, that when the boys grew up, Esau was a skilled hunter, and Jacob was an even-tempered ten man. So the author starts out by using the narrator to describe these two, these two young men. Also introduces that pretty interesting tidbit about their parents, how there's favoritism happening, how Jacob's mom loves him and Esau, and their dad loves Esau. So, and it's because Esau hunts and he brings home some, some tasty food <laughs> from his hunts. So you can sense that drama is afoot here. It's setting it up pretty nicely that way. And also, maybe you noticed it at the end, the narrator closes things off with a pretty important remark too. It says that, so it says, so Esau despised his birthright. In other words, he didn't really respect the fact that he was the eldest son. He wasn't really, didn't really prove himself to be worthy of that title. You can see how these things are really setting the tone. They're really introducing us to the characters and their development. And that one at the end especially, it sets the tone in a really important way because if you were reading this, you might be tempted to think that Jacob's the bad guy. He's the one who, you know, kind of jumped on this opportunity. His brother was at a weak point. He used it to, to trick him into getting what he wanted. But the author's saying, wait, not so fast. In the narrator's voice, he's saying, look at what Esau did too. Esau isn't innocent either. These are complicated characters. Remember, biblical characters are complicated. They're flawed just as much as they are good and strong. They have their weaknesses and all of that. So it's pointing to that here. So that's kind of the things that we're seeing here that the narrator's telling us that we're learning about the characters. And a good question to ask then, who do you think the main character is? What's this, what's this story about? That's going to help us determine that. Well, you kind of have to take a step back. Because really, this one's interesting. Both of them are described, and they're using, the author's using contrast to really get, help us to get to know them. But I think Jacob, if you read onwards into the next stories for, for quite a while, Jacob rises as the clear winner. He's in most of the, like basically all of the rest of the, the narratives that come up, the scenes that come up. He's there at the beginning, he's there at the end, he's there in the climactic moments, all that stuff. But Esau too develops a bit. He's important as well. But Jacob seems to be the main character. And so this is the beginning of Jacob's story. The story about Jacob, but which is also significant from this bigger purpose, how God is going to work in and through Jacob to carry on his, or to preserve his, his people, basically, and to be faithful to this covenant and these promises that he's um, given to Abraham, that Abraham would be the father of many people. It's all linked up that way. So 
he's the main character and that situates us now. We're in a story about Jacob. We're learning about Jacob, this kind of tricky guy who tricked his brother. and That's how he got his elder brother status and, we're, and you would move on from there. Okay, that's an example of what it would be to approach scripture as narrative and as a story when we see that we're indeed in a story. And those are the kinds of questions that are good to ask. Remember, we're kind of treating it like we're in a book club and it, it's actually a lot of fun to treat it that way. Asking, oh, what, what are you getting from this? What do you think when he did that? What do you think that symbolizes? What do you think that means? Those sorts of questions become really powerful, actually, because it's in doing that that we really start to hear Scripture speaking to us because it's going to teach us some really important things about God, actually. We're going to hear the Holy Spirit speak through this to teach us about God and to teach us about God's faithfulness to us and we're also going to see ourselves in the text here. We're going to see ourselves in these characters. These are real people with flaws and weaknesses just like us. And the Bible is brilliant at portraying all of that. It doesn't hold back. It doesn't make them look like they're perfect or anything like that. And by the way, amazing resource for all of this. Check out the Bible Project. They've got a whole section on how to read the Bible. And they've got like six videos on how to read biblical narrative. Highly recommend you go check that out. They have a great one on characterization here. So let's finish off now. And before we finish, I want to leave us with a really encouraging thought from this. And it's this. If there's a theme that arises from the biblical narratives, it's that God loves us and God is a God of grace. I mean, we already saw it here with Jacob and Esau. These are God's people. This is going to be the, the father of the Israelites, the forefather of the Israelites. And it's starting out with trickery. It's starting out with someone who's bamboozling his brother and all of that. But yet, God is faithful. Through our weaknesses, through our flaws, God stays by us. And in fact, what we learn from Jacob, if you were to keep following the story, is that when he keeps coming back to God and indeed opens his heart up to God, we see that God works in and through him in some incredible ways. And if it's true for Jacob, it's true for us as well. As God is taking us through the story of our lives, we can trust that God remains faithful even when we make mistakes. And in fact, actually, if we keep coming back to God, he can work through our mistakes. He can work through our weaknesses. I've been made aware of this even recently. It's incredible to see how God can work even through our weaknesses. Things that, yes, eventually we got to kind of work on, God still uses it for good in our lives. So it's incredible to see these stories um, one after another, they speak to that. They speak to God's grace and God's faithfulness. That's why we meditated on that scripture earlier where Paul talks about that God is faithful in our weaknesses. What did it say, right? Paul said, my, God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. That's something we see happening time and time again through the biblical narratives and especially through the big biblical story from front to back. Great. I'm going to finish off there now. And before we end today, why don't we just take a moment to pray and give God thanks for this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we just praise you for your grace and praise you for your faithfulness. We've read about Jacob. We've read about Esau. And we can see ourselves in them. All of us are flawed. All of us have our weaknesses. But you love us all the same and your grace goes with us. It's your grace that we trust in, not our own strength. And when we do that, we find that Paul's words are true. And we see it in Jacob's life, that you can work through our weaknesses. Your power can even be made known through our weaknesses, and that you can work in and through us in doing amazing things, helping people, really showing your love through us. So we thank you for that. We thank you for hearing that from Scripture today. 
And I pray for all of us that this might be an inspiring time as we learn more about how to read scripture. Please use this to really help us to develop a passion for the Bible and for scripture, a desire to keep coming back to it, and a desire to hear from scripture. Not putting our own meaning into it, but, but hearing what you want to say through it. Thank you for this time together. I pray that you keep us all safe and healthy. May we each sense your presence as we go forward today. And it's in your, son, Jesus, your son's Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, thanks so much for joining us today. And I look forward to when we see each other again next week. God bless. Bye.